I'm here to interview Danny Davies. Um, he's a former teacher, drama instructor, an amazing actor who I've been fortunate enough to have been on a show with, and uh, now a published author of the book, A Rainbow Together. Uh, Danny, how are you doing? I am doing fine. It's great to see you again, Darren. It, it's great to see you. I had a wonderful time with you. And is he dead? Uh, every scene you were in, you stole the show. So oh. well, <laughs> you it was really a pleasure did. to it work was... with you guys, too. Um, what inspired you to be a performer? The school would put on this little play for the Mother's Club. Mm. And um, it was mostly like seventh and eighth graders. But evidently, in this little play, they needed. Um, a, a little kid and um, evidently Sister Germaine said I know who we should ask go ask Danny Davies in first grade to come to my office and so you know I was in class and and this girl came and got me and I thought oh my gosh what have I done am I in trouble <laughs> and she asked me to be in this play and I said oh okay and um I can still remember I have one line and I remember what the line was uh, because they were trying to guess what was inside this box. And okay. I, my guess was, I said, or maybe it's a teeny weeny little mouse. <laughs> and when I said the, that line, the audience burst into laughter and I thought, oh, <laughs> that's pretty cool <laughs> yeah oh yeah yeah I like that that's great. and from that day forward I was like enamored of of theater and um anytime I had the opportunity to to perform in something or organize something I would and uh, even if it meant writing my own plays what uh, what productions have you been involved in uh with Marymont it was in um, 1976, and I was in uh, Inherit the Wind, a guy named Roger Grooms. He was directing that production, mm -hmm. and so a friend of mine, I had been in Village Players prior to, uh, to that for maybe like a, a, a about three years or so, and he said, oh, let's go over to Marymount. They're, they're having this big show, and they need a bunch of people we might get in. So we did, and both of us got cast as townspeople. And so that was my very first show there. And then the following fall, Roger directed um, God's Favorite. And uh, he had said something to me about auditioning for it. And so I did, and uh, I ended up being in that show and playing one of the twins. That was my first show at Marymount. And then I don't think I did anything at Marymount from that point on until um, I did the first Greater Tuna. Okay. With Norman Ninnemans directing that with Wayne Wright. And that we did a zillion times. And Norma was just this phenomenal director also. And of course, to work opposite Wayne Wright. I've never before in my life ever felt as comfortable or trusted someone as much on stage as I did Wayne Wright. And so we instantly knew that we it was all going to work between right. us. And so yeah, we did great. multiple shows after that together. Uh, other than Tuna, were there any other shows until uh, Is He Dead? I did 1940s Radio Hour, uh, The Boys Next Door. Um, oh my goodness. Uh, Groucho, A Life in Review. Mm -hmm. um, especially loved working with Norma. I miss her every yeah. day. What would be some of your favorite and most memorable theatrical experiences? Obviously being in all the tunas, because right. that was, some, you know, something that in the beginning, as you know, when you first start to tackle that show, you think, oh my God, I can't do this. <laughs> right. I, I, you know, it's, it's overwhelming. And then it just starts falling into place. It was just a great deal of fun. And the um, opportunity to create so many different characters. Yeah. That, that's... And it was, you know, the whole backstage thing that goes on is right. wild too. And so that's when we did, um, the mystery of Irma Vep, that was as 
crazy as um, Tuna was, even almost even more so because the set would change sometimes uh -huh. too. Okay. And um, Norma directed that, and I and Wayne was the other character, uh, okay. other actor in that as well. Almost every show I've ever done at Marymount, all of them are such distinct experiences because you're the chemistry of the people you work with both mm -hmm. on stage and off affects that and well that's great yeah. you know basically going in that you're pretty much going to be in a quality production and that is both flattering to you as an actor yes. and it spoils you as an actor when did you move into writing i taught english and theater uh, all through my teaching career you know, the old adage that those who can't teach. Mm -hmm. And I sometimes <laughs> felt that about teaching writing because right. I would uh. know what good writing was and I would try to um, convey that to mm -hmm. students and giving them, you know, techniques and, and methods and, and, you know, good structure and whatever. But whenever I wrote something myself, I hated it and I would... <laughs> You know, like write, you know, five paragraphs and then it end up crumbled up and thrown in the trash can. And I don't know what clicked with this novel. Mm -hmm. In fact, I was just talking to um, a good friend of mine, a fellow writer who's in my writing group, and she's a, a playwright. And we were talking and she said, Danny, can you believe that you wrote that novel and i said no i if someone would have told me oh you're going to write a novel i would have laughed at them but we both said that in it's almost like performing in a way that somehow this entity takes over right yeah. and it just happens neat. and neat. fortunately i didn't you know quit i i would get to my computer and sometimes writing it, I would like go, oh my gosh, I've been writing for two hours and uh -huh. I, you know, you didn't even know. I feel very blessed that it came to fruition. So, um, you know, it took me seven years to finish it. My first manuscript was like 500 and something pages <laughs> long. And I think it ended up publishing at like 232. So I did an awful lot of editing afterwards because as a teacher, you have to repeat things a zillion times to your students because you think, oh, otherwise they don't get it. And so when I went back and started the editing process, I went, you know, I've said this 53 times. I don't think I have to. So I'm a good writing coach of mine said to me trust your reader to add the one and one together and they'll that, come up with the yeah. two why don't you tell us a little bit about it it is a coming of age story um and it was inspired a little bit by uh, an experience an experience i had as a teenager um i was in um explorer scout people that are in high school the troop leader of that was um, a manager at the Sheraton Gibson Hotel in downtown Cincinnati. And um, he had a busy summer and he had contacted some of us who were in um, the Explorer Scouts. And he said, I'd really like some of you to um, help me out if you can. And he said, I, it's not an everyday thing. It'll be here and there throughout, but I need for you to come over and do some, you know, like grunt work and sometimes help run elevators when conventions are coming in and out and all, all this type of stuff. And so I, I, of course, jumped at the chance and it just was such an incredible experience of working in that environment in, in, in a, you know, posh hotel and that right. sort of thing. And um, so I was just remembering that a little bit. And I was just remembering a certain day. And um, I started to just write like what I thought was a little memoir of one afternoon. 
suddenly as I started writing it, I thought, oh wait, this, this, there's more to say. And then as I continued to write it, I thought, and this isn't really about me. It's sort of taking on a life of its own. And um, so anyway, it, the story is a coming of age of a boy who goes to work there and he turns 17 years old that summer. Okay. And he's lived this very kind of sheltered Northern Kentucky Catholic life. Mm -hmm. And crossing the river could be like, you know, a, a magnificent journey to mm -hmm. come into a big city uh, from a small uh, Northern Kentucky town. And it just opens his eyes to this other world. Okay. And it's also set against the backdrop of the summer of 1964, which was the Freedom Summer, when, you know, there were all these college students and, and traveling to the South to help register voters. And, mm -hmm. you know, it was a very tumultuous time. So that added to the, to it. And it just developed into this wonderful story about this young boy coming to terms with who and what he is right. and having trying to find the courage to be that uh, a, a rainbow together it, so, it sounds uh, fascinating the title comes from the song um volare and and uh in that song it says just like birds of a feather a rainbow together will nice. find should i go to the the lulu the, the publisher you know you can get the digital version uh, a paperback or a hardback now we're going to see um a cutting or uh from from the the book can you set that up for us davy is the protagonist uh, of the of the novel and his best friend um father was really kind of a abusive and cruel man mm. uh and davy feared him a lot um, was intimidated by him. This scene that they're doing is very near the end of the novel, okay. and it's Christmas Eve, and Davy's parents have already left the house to go to the family Christmas celebration, and he was left behind to get ready and go because he had just come home from college at that point. And... Um, there is this man, his friend Tony's father. Uh -huh. And he, you know, like, oh my God. It is such a powerful scene that what happens after that, if I may say so myself, um, that redeems both characters. I'm really, really looking forward to seeing what um, uh, these two actors do with it because they're the only two really in the in the scene there thank you so much for for uh sharing your time with us danny it was my pleasure and i look forward to working with you again darren mr de stefano seemed disoriented when he opened the gate he shivered violently as if he'd been standing in the cold for hours I wondered if he were lost and simply happened upon our house by accident. He glanced at me and then quickly looked away, focusing attention on the package he held. In that brief look, his eyes unsettled me. Deep set and chocolate brown. They were Tony's eyes, but bleary with age. Your tree is real pretty. Lots of lights. This wrapping paper has fragile written all over it. So I've been extra careful with it. Kept it next to me on the front seat all the way here. You know, instead of putting it in the trunk. But please, take it. It's from Tony. His personal effects arrived last week. I imagine he wanted to mail it home himself. Can I, can I get you something to drink? Oh, no. N no, no thank you, son. I, I have to get back home. 
They're waiting for me. Mr. DeStefano? Merry Christmas. Hi. I'm so sorry for your loss. I should have told you that at the funeral. I'm... Please forgive me. You're a good man, David. Good man. Merry Christmas. I watched him leave. I stayed there until the red glow of taillights disappeared into winter darkness. My parents seemed to understand my wanting to attend Midnight Mass at St. Louis, so they excused me from further family commitments. My intent was to commemorate Tony more than to respect any religious obligation. By then, my Catholic fervor had faded, diminished by an ever-widening chasm between the precepts of my past and the ideals of my present. Yet, my spirit still sought enlightenment still searched for meaning, still strove to square things with a God who I believed had not yet forsaken me. So still I prayed, and still I hoped that someday those prayers could be answered. A long queue formed outside the Timestown Cinema. Above the marquee, a magnificent three-panel billboard towered a story higher than the top of beacons deep into the winter night. Those fabricated Christmas stars guided worshippers of another sort. Finally, James Bond was returning in Thunderball. In an instant, I had changed my mind. Honoring Tony far differently than planned, I hurriedly purchased the last remaining ticket for the midnight premiere. In the crowded dark of that theater, Baptized in a glorious technicolor glow, I felt Tony sharing this adventure with his idolized secret agent. I imagined his fingers smoothing through the tussles of my wind-tangled hair. I left the theater transformed. On that blessed Christmas night, I released my fear. My best friend had returned to guide me home.